fellow budding chemists. So good to have you here with me and my pens and my periodic table, my paper, and net ionic equations. Well, we're going to be talking about net ionic equations, but on the context of precipitation reactions. When you first begin learning about chemistry, one of the things you learn is about the different types of chemical reactions that there are. You learn about acid-base chemistry, which I've had a couple videos recently about those. And you learn about redox reactions. I have a few videos about that as well. And precipitation reactions. So I thought I would begin by filling up all of my fountain pens with ink. So I've got these. Oh, I should tell you about this. I just love them. These are called Twisby, is the brand name. And they are just the most lovely fountain pens because, check this out. I know this sounds like an advertisement, but it's not. It's just that I love these pens. I should ask them to sponsor this, shouldn't I? Anyway, um, I love these pens because I've done a lot of calligraphy and I was getting frustrated with the dipping the pens in the ink and then sometimes it would drip and anyway it just got kind of messy and these fountain pens you can suction up the ink and it's just so much easier and cleaner so this is the direction I've gone. should have put it in the blue pen, but it's in the yellow one, but can you see that bud? You kind of see the blue right there. Anyway, I just love these pens, so I wanted to give a shout out to Twisby. I first want to begin by talking about what are precipitation reactions and honestly, why do we care about them? And why are they taught as being fairly important in general chemistry? So, part of this is that there are some compounds that are not soluble in water. They become solids in water. An example of this are many of our heavy metals. They tend to be insoluble in water. Depends on what nonmetals or polyatomic ions they are combined with, of course. But, for example, cadmium sulfide, very insoluble in water. Aluminum oxide, ooh, extremely insoluble. Mercury, sulfide, and even lead oxide, lead sulfide. I could go on and on. Barium, 
sulfate, etc. Now, when you learn solubility rules, it's like a yes, no. Yes, it's soluble, or no, it's not. When you first learn solubility rules, that's usually how it's taught. I do want to warn you <laughs> that it's not a yes, no. It's a spectrum, as are most things. So things are, are extremely insoluble. Some are somewhat insoluble. Some are slightly soluble, and some things are very soluble. And so that's where you want to do calculations to determine its precise solubility. And you can use KSP. That is the solubility product equilibrium constant. And I do have a video on that if you want to learn more about it. But what we're talking about here is the case where you have an ionic compound that is insoluble. And when you are creating this metal and non-metal combination, or usually a metal and a non-metal or polyatomic ion combination, that is insoluble, you get your solid. And this can impact environmental systems. So say there's a battery plant that's near a lake and it makes NiCad batteries, nickel cadmium. And so you could get solids that are forming with the cadmium, for example, and many other, many, many other examples that can impact either the environment or our bodies biologically. Uh, kidney stones, there's an example there. So, sometimes it is not so detrimental, but sometimes it is. So, it is important that we understand precipitation reactions, what they are, and really what is the chemistry that is occurring that we need to be concerned about. So, I'm going to go through an example, and I'm going to be focusing on silver, silver ion, and chloride. Let's look back at the periodic table. Okay, so here's our silver, right there. Here's our chlorine, and that becomes a chloride, right there. Okay. And if we were to imagine that we are taking two solutions. One of them is sodium chloride. Okay, and this is an aqueous solution because sodium chloride is soluble. So the AQ, when you see that, you can immediately assume that this ionic compound is soluble in And the same is true for silver nitrate. Nitrate happens to be one of those lovely polyatomic anions that when it's combined with any metal, it will be soluble. So it's a very handy anion to use if you want your ionic compound to be soluble. Okay, so here we can imagine we've got some sodium chloride, we've got some silver nitrate, also soluble, but then we mix them together. All right, so perhaps we have two test tubes and we just pour one into the other, or maybe we're titrating using a burette with one going into the other. But however it happens, we are mixing these two colorless solutions together. And this is what we can expect to happen. Alright? 
what occurs is what we call a double displacement. And we see that silver chloride, which is insoluble, forms. It is insoluble, so now we designate it as a solid because a solid forms. The color of this is white. But, of course, we need to have a balanced chemical reaction here. Balanced chemical equation. And that means we have sodium nitrate. Is the other product. Sodium when it is the cation, the compound is soluble. And that's also true for nitrate, as I just said previously. So we can feel confident that this will be aqueous. So this is one of the things that we will see with precipitation reactions, is that with the products, one will be a solid and the other will be aqueous. Okay. Now, this reaction is useful in some ways. It's showing us what we are mixing together, and it shows us that we get a solid. It also shows us that it is a balanced chemical reaction. But the thing about this is it's not really telling us everything that's going on in solution. Because what is sodium chloride in an aqueous solution? Well, it's not staying together as sodium ions bonded directly to chloride atoms like we would see in a covalent bond. But rather, these are ions that are solvated. They're surrounded by water molecules with ion dipole intermolecular forces. So this particular way of writing out a precipitation reaction actually has a specific name that is referring to just using the formulas of these compounds. So that's why it is called a formula equation. So in contrast, we can write out an equation that's really showing a little bit better what is actually occurring in the solution. And this is called the ionic equation. This is acknowledging that the sodium is an ion, and it is surrounded by water molecules, and so is the chloride. It is separated from the sodium in that solution and surrounded by water molecules, aqueous. And so, of course, so is the sodium and so is the nitrate. So we're going to write all these ions out as aqueous ions, which is truly showing how they exist in solution. I will mention that this is immediately prior to the silver and the chloride finding each other. Because as soon as these get close, they will form an ionic bond and they will form an insoluble solid. So as soon as that happens, we now have sodium chloride again insoluble so it will show up as 
we say it's a solid, we say it's a precipitate, all right? But regardless, this will make the solution appear cloudy. And eventually, when this settles to the bottom, we will see a layer of this white solid at the bottom and the rest of the solution on the top. And again, we've got sodium, ions surrounded by the water molecules and nitrate polyatomic ions also solvated okay so again this is the ionic equation because it's showing the ions Now let's ponder what's going on here for a moment, okay? We've got my other pen here. We've got sodium ions and we have sodium ions. So these sodium ions that are in solution have not changed. They're still there. So there is no chemistry that's happening. There's no chemical change has occurred with the sodium ions. It's identical on both sides. So that means we can actually cancel them out on both sides. We have our sodium, our sodium, all right? What else appears on both sides? Yes, the nitrate and the nitrate. So we can also cancel those out because no chemical change has happened. And what are we trying to portray here but a chemical equation that is showing a chemical change? All right, so when we have these ions that are aqueous and they are exhibiting ion dipole interactions between the ions and the water molecules, what has happened here? is ionic bonds have formed. And in that change, therein lies the chemical change that has occurred. And so when we write the net ionic equation, we can now Leave out the sodium ions that appear on both sides. Just like if this were a mathematical equation, I had x plus everything else on this side equals, and then there was x plus everything else on this side, we could cancel out x on both sides. It's the same idea here with the sodium ions and with the nitrate ions. So what does that leave? That leaves solution reacting with silver ions in aqueous solution to form an ionic solid silver chloride. Here is our net ionic This is the one that is really getting to the crux of the chemistry that is happening in this excuse me, precipitation reaction. Okay, 
So I wanted to show another example that has a little bit more complex stoichiatry. Okay. So one that we could show could be, for example, let's look at lead nitrate. And this specifically is lead 2, meaning its oxidation number is plus 2. So lead 2 nitrate then has two nitrates in the formula equation since nitrate is minus 1 and this lead is plus 2. Okay, so this could be reacting with potassium bromide, for example. This is also aqueous. Okay, so it just so happens that the resulting product lead bromide bromide's minus 1 so we do need a 2 there since it's a lead plus 2 lead 2 bromide is insoluble so this is our precipitate as we call it and if we look at the other product here that means we have potassium and nitrate. Okay, so here's our potassium, it's plus one, and nitrate is minus one. So this formula would be one to one, and this is soluble. All ionic compounds with potassium are soluble, and all ionic compounds with nitrate are also soluble. Okay, so we know that's going to be Let's balance this chemical equation. We see here that it necessitates that there are two nitrates because it's lead plus two, right? So it means we're going to have to have two nitrates over here. Meanwhile, that's okay that we do that because we see that there are two bromides here in this formula so we're going to need two bromides here, and we will have to use the stoichiometric coefficient of two there. So having a two there, having a two there, will allow this chemical equation to now be balanced. Okay, so just keep that in mind when your formula has a subscript of some kind when you have to have either in this case two bromides or two nitrates of this whole polyatomic it is very likely that you will need to invoke stoichiometric coefficients to make sure everything is balanced okay so we can then take a look and see what would the ionic equation look like and what would the net ionic equation look like. Alright, so think about this. What would this look like? And then I'm going to write it out. And we can check what you were thinking this would look like in terms of an ionic equation. Let's see if it matches. Okay, so the lead, as I said, is plus 2, and it is aqueous. Any of the ions from this formula, if it says aqueous here, it's pertaining to both of these ions when they are broken apart in solution. So here's our lead plus 2, aqueous. All right, and now, check this out. We've got two nitrate ions per lead. So that means when they break apart, we're saying 
there are two separate nitrate ions. And each of those nitrate ions are surrounded by water molecules, or in other words, they are aqueous. Okay, so don't forget this. I would say this is a very common mistake that I see my students do. So let's double check that you take the whole formula and make sure you're breaking it apart into all the pieces and acknowledging that there are the correct number of each one of the ions. Same thing holds true now for this potassium bromide where there's the stoichiometric coefficient of two in front of this whole unit. So it's usually straightforward to see how that two would be in front of the potassium, and that's also aqueous. But remember, this two is also telling us that there are two bromides. So we need to make sure that that two is there as well. And then our products, we've got our solid. Notice we do not break this apart. We didn't do that for the, excuse me, the silver chloride either. This is a solid. This stays together as one piece. We do not break that apart. So notice how that is consistent. Silver chloride is insoluble. It's a solid. Silver chloride, solid, stays together. Silver chloride, solid, stays together. Okay, so the solid will always show up as one unit. It's only when we have these ions that are in solution, that are then surrounded by water molecules, then we break them apart. Okay, so here is our ionic equation. Let's see, I do have room. So now we can do a little bit of analysis here and think of what is appearing on both sides that we can essentially cross out. Lead, okay, lead's reacting to become the solid, so that ion is not appearing on both sides as aqueous. How about the nitrate? Two nitrate ions aqueous, two nitrate ions aqueous, indeed. We see that on both sides. So we know that we can cross that out. And same with the two potassium ions. All right, oh, I forgot my negative charge. If we were in class, you'd be able to raise your hand and say, oh, excuse me, did you forget the negative charge? <laughs> All right, but I got it, fortunately. Okay, so two bromides on this side. Aha, they have become part of the solid. A chemical change has occurred. All right, so those are going to stay put. And ultimately, for the net, ionic equation, we've got lead plus two aqueous plus two bromide ions, they're aqueous, to form lead Here is our 
Magnet, Ionic, Equation. All right. Well, I hope this was helpful for you as you are learning about precipitation reactions or curious about them, how they work. How to distinguish between formula equations, ionic equations, and then the net ionic equations. Oh, this one I didn't write out what this was. For completion, let me do that. Formula equation. So as always, thank you for being here. Thank you for subscribing. The more my channel grows, the more I will be able to create more videos. And I really enjoy doing this. I'm so, so grateful for all of you who write messages and send your gratitude and just lovely, lovely messages. I just can't even begin to explain how happy it makes me that I can share my years of experience of teaching and that it helps people far and wide and um, maybe you don't even care about chemistry and you just want to sleep and that's okay too. I'm totally fine with that. So I appreciate all of you. I appreciate uh, those of you, a few of you who have given thanks via the form of uh, super thanks and donations and um, Patreon and uh, all those things. It's so, so grateful for that. It does help me. Um, I do things like buy pens and I'm buying better equipment to make higher quality videos. So. It really does mean a lot. So thank you. Thanks for being here with me and being part of the ASMR community. Have a wonderful rest of your day or night, and I will see you in the next video. Thank you.